planes are a national obsession. Since the earliest days of flight, Britain has designed and built some of the world's most iconic aircraft. We all go weak at the knees when we see the Spitfire overhead, and you probably want to burst into tears when you see them. During decades of conflict, the planes that Britain built helped build our nation. If it wasn't for the Camel, would we have won World War One? I'm not sure. What did the Lancaster do for us as a nation? It led Europe to freedom. In this series, we'll be revealing how British-built planes revolutionised aerial combat. Having forward-facing machine guns, having the technology, gives you the edge. Plus, we'll meet the people determined to keep these icons of aviation in the air and preserve them for generations to come. This time, the game-changing British innovation that reinvented the modern jet fighter. It's a proper, proper British design. It was an incredible coup for Britain to produce the first vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Incredible! It helped prevent the Cold War from turning hot. Providing we had tactical air forces, then that is an effective deterrent to attack without having to rely on nuclear weapons. And it was decisive in winning back the Falklands. It was miraculous what those Harriers proved able to do. They were crucial to the war effort, there's no doubt about that. In 1953, the Cold War was at its height. The Soviet Union exploded its first hydrogen bomb, which was around 30 times more powerful than the atom bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. Less than a decade after the Soviets helped Britain and America defeat Nazi Germany, they were now the biggest threat facing the West. The free world and the communists launched a subtle war of diplomatic maneuver. Propaganda. It is a war in which a carefully timed show of force can be more effective than a pitched battle. You had East versus West. The Soviet Union ranged against what would become the forces of NATO. And aviation was absolutely at the heart of NATO's concept of operations. What's the key thing about the Cold War? Jet age. Air power now could go further, higher, and faster. Even World War II, you would have to send maybe a thousand bombers into the heart of the enemy territory. In the Cold War period, you had to send one bomber armed with an atomic or a nuclear weapon into the heart of enemy territory to achieve your aim. In case the Russians attacked, NATO had built air bases all over West Germany, but they were vulnerable. It was always obvious that if hostilities started, the first thing the Russians were going to try and do was take out all our air bases in Germany. Britain feared a repeat of World War II, where the German Luftwaffe attacked the RAF before they even got off the ground. Our airfields and runways had been virtually defenceless against bombing raids. Those bases were easy targets for mass strikes, whether that is a mass attack by conventional weapons or a nuclear attack. Every aircraft was housed in a hardened aircraft shelter, a massive concrete structure at which you were protected against nuclear, biological and chemical warfare. But if you had, you know, 50, 60, 100 Soviet bombers coming over, they could devastate the runway if you lost your 7,000 feet or your 10,000 feet of asphalt, you weren't going anywhere. What was really sought after was an aircraft that could do vertical takeoff and vertical landing. And that would make it so much more effective because really you could put it anywhere. Otherwise, you have to keep your aircraft on a base and they are a target. Military commanders seem to be asking for the impossible. A machine that was half helicopter, half high-speed jet plane. 
But then, at the dawn of the space age, anything seemed possible. 1957, year of space and Sputnik dogs. Laika, first space traveler, was ready for the takeoff to orbit around the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour with its passenger. In the 50s, it's a time of blue sky thinking. It's really anything is possible. The Army is experimenting with the Aerocycle, a one-man flying platform capable of carrying a fully equipped soldier at 40 miles an hour. In fact, the science behind the Harrier jump jet owes more to rocket technology than to conventional winged aircraft. All other planes, from a Spitfire to a jumbo jet, are able to take off, then remain in the air, because air traveling at hundreds of miles per hour over the wings provides enough lift to keep them airborne. A helicopter works in exactly the same way. Its rotor blades are like wings spinning fast enough to generate lift and hoist the rest of the chopper into the air. But the challenge facing the world's smartest engineers was how to lift an aircraft into the air without any of the assistance that comes from the basic principles of powered flight. Scientists around the world had wrestled with the problem with little success. In the post-war years, Britain had ceased to be a military superpower, but it did have world-class inventors and engineers. In 1954, a team from Rolls-Royce unveiled a remarkable experimental flying machine. Its official name was the Thrust Measuring Rig. Unofficially, they called it the Flying Bedstead. The idea was to see if, with a jet engine, you could put a machine vertically up, let it hover, and come down vertically again. And on top of it was a platform for the pilot. And it was supported by four legs with casters on the end of them. But it hovered for something like six minutes. The flying bedstead was a remarkable piece of technology, but hardly likely to frighten the Russians. Could this new technology ever be weaponized? The Air Ministry put out a specification for an aircraft that would not only go up and down, but would actually go horizontally as well. Belfast-based air manufacturer Short Brothers came up with the SC-1, the first British fixed-wing vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL jet. Now, this aircraft had five engines, four for the vertical takeoff element and one then for conventional flight. But five engines wasn't a practical solution for a fighter jet. If you carry vertical lift engines in a military aircraft, that is dead weight when you're in combat. So you really need to try to use your pushing engines also for the vertical landing and takeoff. What was needed was one engine that could replace the five that powered the SC-1. The Bristol Aero Engine Company came up with the answer, the BE-53 Pegasus. But what they didn't have was a plane. Step forward, Ralph Hooper, a young designer at Hawker Sidley. Ralph Hooper thought, well, I can, with a slide rule, I can see if I can work something out here. Because what we're looking for is an airframe to carry the BE-53 engine. The airframe that Ralph Hooper designed formed the prototype for the Harrier. The Pegasus engine provided around 20,000 pounds of thrust. Two nozzles on each side of the fuselage could be tilted to alter the direction of thrust. Point them down, open the throttle, and the plane takes off. Tilt them back up again, and the plane flies forward. Effectively, what uh, Hawker were doing was reducing an airframe for an engine. So, in a sense, the Harrier was an engine with wings. By 1965, the Harrier prototype was ready to be unveiled to the watching top brass. Good news indeed for the aircraft industry. The deserved reward of British know-how. It was an incredible coup for Britain to produce the first vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Incredible. This really was saying, we are the future. We have the brain power. British engineers had made an astonishing breakthrough. 
but this radical new design was still unproven. However, an air race from London to New York would give the Harrier the chance to show off its unique capabilities to the world. You know, for a certain breed of aviation fanatic, the Harrier jump jet isn't just another plane, it's an icon and a reminder of how Britain led the way in inventing a jet aircraft with the handy benefits of a helicopter. Although the Harrier has now been retired from service by both the RAF and the Royal Navy, this very rare example is one of the few that remains in partial working order. A group of enthusiasts, mostly ex-military, rescued Harrier XV-808, which might otherwise have been headed for the scrap heap. For pilot Ollie Suckling and his colleagues, the Harrier represents the best of British. This is a Harrier GR3, and it's one of the first generation of the Harrier aircraft. And you can see that the cockpit is quite small. Fitting in this with all the kit is very difficult with all your uh, documents as well. You need to take with you, there's not much room. Moving on to the intake, one of the most distinctive features of the aircraft with a Pegasus Mark 103 engine, a big fan, which what creates the wine that's so familiar about the uh, Harrier. The main thing that people know the Harrier for obviously are the nozzles which are here. The nozzles are moved in the cockpit by air, we can also uh, move them down. So when the pilot's coming down, the uh, nozzles will move down to whatever position he has set in the cockpit and could go all the way down for hovering. You can see the aircraft is a little bit dirty. Obviously, we've only got a grass airfield here to run it round on. We have to be particularly careful when running out the field that we don't run the engine at high power because we only have one and we don't want to break it. It's a proper British design. This aircraft, which first flew in 1971 and with a host of complex flight systems, is no longer certified as fully airworthy. But its Pegasus engine has been painstakingly restored. In one of its periodic test runs, they're about to discover whether that engine, now almost half a century old, is still in good shape. OK, so the camping's closed and lock the batteries, come on, one and two, checking the voltage on each of those, selecting that to start. The brakes are on and the engine's winding up. Signalling to the ground crew and raising the cover. Three seconds, waiting for ignition. Accelerating. High pressures are good, engine's running fine. For the Harrier engine, this is just ticking over. But Ollie won't push it anymore. Taking off isn't part of the agenda. Nozzles are at 10 degrees, moving the handle now. And back up, not too far, we don't want to fob the engine. Flaps coming down, indicating up. Pick on flying controls. They're all good, pressures are stable, and everything's running fine. Today's engine test is declared a success. It's the backwards, sideways, and standing still plane. Its capabilities include turning on its own axis, and of course it doesn't depend on conventional and vulnerable concrete runway. In 1969, the first Harriers entered service with No. 1 Squadron at RAF Wittering. A young Brian Baker was flight commander of the unit. We were pretty juiced up with life, looking for a challenge. And the more exciting the challenge, then uh, the more pleasure it was going to give you. So to fly something like this, and of course, 21 years old, straight from school, I didn't have a driving license when I flew my first jet. 
When I first flew the Harrier, I was 22 years old, I think. I just couldn't believe that somebody was paying me to do that. You know, it, it, it was better than having an E-Type Jaguar, which was the best sports car at the time. It was just awesome. But for the first generation of Harrier pilots, flying it presented a unique set of challenges. The combined skill set that the pilots required at the time was just phenomenal. You had to be the cream of the crop, the very best, because you needed two skills. You needed the skill to be able to fly a rotary aircraft, so a helicopter, but you also needed the skill to fly fast jet. The key part, obviously, is the vertical takeoff bit. And the really tricky bit is going from conventional flight to hovering flight, or from hovering flight to conventional flight. If you don't get them right, the aeroplane is going to be uncontrollable. Even experienced pilots like Brian Baker made mistakes. In the very early days, most of us got it wrong. I got it wrong once, and the result in my case was simply quite a heavy landing, which fortunately didn't damage the aircraft. So everyone needs a bit of luck as well. But sadly, some Harrier pilots saw their luck run out. There are a number of accidents. We did lose quite a few uh, in the early days as they were figuring out what the aeroplane could and couldn't do. It would kick you very quickly if you got it wrong. It was an unforgiving aeroplane. The Harrier was the answer to one key question. How could Britain fight back if Russia destroyed our airfields in Germany? In the late 1960s, that didn't seem such a far-fetched possibility. In 1968, Soviet tanks rolled into Czechoslovakia, which borders Germany, to crush anti-Soviet protesters. We lived under the constant awareness that there was a threat out there. The whole of the Cold War was based on posturing, if you like. You know, you've got 10 of those, so we'll have 10 of those, so that you don't feel you've got enough superiority to come near us. In 1970, the RAF sent two Harrier squadrons to Germany, where they became a vital part of the West's changing military deterrent. Initially, the NATO defense against Russia was tripwire concept, which was basically the first Russian foot across the border. We would stop their armies with nuclear weapons. But that was becoming less and less acceptable, so NATO adopted a policy called flexible response, where we would try, if we could, to stop their armies coming across Europe with conventional means. In the event of war, the Harrier's job was to operate as a ground attack jet to take out advancing Russian tank columns. For young Harrier pilot Tony Harper, Germany was his first overseas posting. Life was work hard, play hard. If war broke out, we were expecting the Russian uh, and East German forces to come across and try and invade the inner German border. And we were just sort of soldiers in aeroplanes. Um, as an, as an insurance policy against this. The Harrier's ability to take off and land on a sixpence meant that in the event of an all-out Russian attack, it could slip away and hide amongst the trees. We were generally operating out of woodland. Um, we also used to live in cam netting, uh, which we spread over the top of us, basically somewhere which would give us camouflage. When I was a technician, we operated uh, the communications for part of the Harrier force, and we would find ourselves in the middle of nowhere, where you would have a Harrier simply coming out of its hide and taking off from an opening in woods. And it could continue to operate and continue to take the fight to the enemy if the Cold War ever turned hot, and that was the very raison d'etre for the Harrier. If you knew that you'd been found in a site, you would move. Our philosophy at first was, we're going to have to move every 48 hours, otherwise we'll get smashed. From their improvised bases, the Harrier squadrons were capable of launching lightning-fast attacks. We would operate very close to the battlefront, and we would carry a limited weapon load, but carry it very quickly to where the battle was, and come back and rearm. And we would aim to fly the, the aircraft many times during the day, keep on taking the weapons. 
Playing Harrier Hide and Seek was more than just a war game. Bob Iverson believes the Harrier made the world a safer place by showing the Russians that they simply couldn't knock out the RAF. Providing we had effective armies on the ground and tactical air forces supporting them in the air, then that is an effective deterrent to attack without having to rely on nuclear weapons. From the RAF's point of view, the Harrier was a very big part of that. The people who flew the Harrier knew it was one of Britain's greatest inventions. And in 1969, they got the chance to tell the rest of the world. The Daily Mail had announced an international air race from London to New York. And the start point was at the top of what used to be called the GPO Tower, just up there. The UK government thought here was the chance to showcase the Harrier and maybe pick up valuable foreign sales. Squadron leader Tom Leckie Thompson was hand-picked for the race. The challenge was to do the shortest time between the top of the GPO Tower in London and the top of the Empire State Building in New York. As squadron leader Thompson set off, a helicopter was waiting to transport him a mile and a half away to the coal yard at St Pancras Station, where his Harrier was waiting. This gave him a huge head start on the competition, who had to take off from suburban airfields. And I started up at seven minutes and 10 seconds after leaving the top of the GPO tower. The Harrier was designed to undertake short-range missions, so crossing over 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean meant regular refueling. I got to the top of the climb, and I was plugged in on my first flight refueling at 10 past 10, and I flew across the Atlantic with seven further flight refuelings. After six hours in the air, as squadron leader Thompson approached New York, he was in with a chance of a winning time. Got permission by the Americans to fly across Long Island at 550 knots at 500 feet up East River and landed on 25th Street East Manhattan. As his plane touched down, a motorbike was waiting to whisk him away. While the competition were forced to land at a military airbase outside the city, the Harrier was parked just a few blocks from the finish line at the top of the Empire State Building. The total time was 6 hours, 11 minutes and 57.15 seconds. Its time was good enough to win the race to New York. And this is the actual plane that won. Now, this victory made headlines around the world, and it put the Harrier firmly in the shop window. We wanted to take it to America to try and sell it to the Americans and anybody else. And I think we did a quite a good job because we managed to get sales worth over 980 million pounds out of that um, big show that we put on. The Harrier had demonstrated its remarkable versatility, but it was still untested in battle. It would take a war over a little known group of islands in the South Atlantic to earn its place in military history. The British Harrier jump jet. It was a unique aircraft in the 1980s, the only one we had capable of vertical takeoff and landing. It had spent a decade on frontline duty in the tense standoff with the Soviet Union. But there was just one problem. Nobody had ever tried the Harrier in combat conditions. People had seen it operating, but nobody had seen it fighting. So until you see what happens in combat, you just don't know what an aircraft is worth. The Harrier's moment of truth came in 1982, 
but not fighting Russians in Germany. Instead, fighting a war 8,000 miles away, the war to regain the Falkland Islands. This windswept archipelago in the South Atlantic, home to less than 4,000 people, was an all but forgotten legacy of the British Empire. The first time many in Britain had even heard of the Falklands was when neighboring Argentina claimed they were the rightful owners and mounted an invasion. Argentina go into the Falklands. We then send down our task force. For the first time since World War II, a British invasion fleet left the south coast of England, this time bound for the South Atlantic. Once the ships arrived, there'd be plenty of people trying to sink them. But what is going to protect the task force that went down to the Falklands in 1982? The Sea Harrier. The Sea Harrier was the name given to the modified version, adopted in 1980 by Britain's Royal Navy in a bid to save money. The Navy could no longer afford the kind of huge aircraft carriers with a vast flight deck traditionally required to land jet aircraft. The British had pulled out of the big aircraft carrier business and they no longer had fleet carriers, the kind the Royal Navy had been so proud of for so long. And all they had were these little carriers that could only fly um, the Harrier. And there is absolutely no doubt we could not have fought and won uh, the Falklands War without the Harrier. One contingent of Harriers actually made their way to the Falklands on the deck of a container ship, the Atlantic Conveyor, chartered by the British government. And so, as the day of battle rapidly approached, Britain had an aircraft never tested in war to be flown by pilots with zero or little combat experience. Bob Iverson was one of them. A Harrier pilot for 10 years, this would be his first time in battle. During that period, we weren't involved in any live wars involving uh, aircraft. It was a great time of peace, up, right up until the Falklands War, I think, was the first time that the RAF had been involved in, if you like, real live shooting wars. Tony Harper was another first-timer. For him, even operating at sea was a novel experience. The first time I landed on a ship was when I landed on Atlantic Conveyor, and the second time was when I landed on HMS Hermes. Britain sent 38 Harriers on the long journey south to the Falklands. 10 RAF Harriers, including Bob and Tony's aircrafts, were tasked with supporting British ground troops as they fought their way across the islands, attempting to dislodge the Argentine invaders. While 28 Navy Sea Harriers were assigned the task of defending the British fleet, from marauding Argentinian aircraft. The Harriers, with no history of actual combat, were outnumbered six to one by proven Argentinian aircraft, like the Super Etendard fighter bomber. How much was at stake became clear on May the 4th, when an Exocet missile fired from an Argentine jet struck the destroyer HMS Sheffield, which eventually sank. A fortnight later, British landing ships in San Carlos Bay again came under heavy air attack. But thanks to the Harrier, many more attacks were repelled. And the balance of power began to shift. Not a single Harrier was lost to enemy aircraft. Yet 20 Argentinian planes were shot down by the Harrier's missiles. And what was decisive in the South Atlantic was the American Sidewinder missile, which the Harriers carried. And the Harrier proved a very robust, survivable platform for the Sidewinder missile. It was that match of the Sidewinders and the Harriers that made it possible for us to fight and win the Falklands War. One reason the heat-seeking Sidewinders were so effective was the bitterly cold weather. They were programmed to home in on the infrared glow of the Argentine aircraft. It was the perfect environment for infrared air-to-air -air missile. You can't get anything better than an ice-cold sea or ice-cold land as a, as a background. 
So the uh, kill rates on the firings of the uh, sidewinders were very high, uh, a lot higher than they would be in Central Europe over a burning battlefield because everything's infrared. But Bob was soon to find himself in the crosshairs, a victim of enemy anti-aircraft fire, as British paratroops fought with Argentine soldiers during what became known as the Battle of Goose Green. And it was on that last attack as I was pulling off, running out across the airfield at uh, Goose Green, that I was hit. It was an enormous bang, which slammed the aeroplane sideways such that it cracked my visor against the side of the uh, cockpit. He grabbed the ejector seat control and was rocketed out of the burning Harrier. It's a hell of a kick up the backside, and you pretty much black out, or I did, uh, for a bit. And I was just coming to, and then the chute opened, and I landed a couple of seconds later, so it was quite close. Bob was still alive, but had landed behind enemy lines. I didn't want to become a prisoner of war. It's a, everyone's duty to avoid capture if, uh, if at all possible, uh, so they can't interrogate you. And also, you want to get back to your own side so that you can continue the battle. As the battle raged all around, Bob hid for two days in an abandoned farmhouse. Then he saw British paratroopers approaching his hideaway. I came out waving my hands to find out that we'd won the Battle of Goose Green. Tony Harper's Harrier also played a key role in this battle the turning point of the Falklands War. Uh, three of us were tasked to go and attack Goose Green with cluster bombs and rockets, and uh, we came over hill and it was a copybook attack. The paratroopers commander then gave the Argentines a chance to call it a day. So the story goes, uh, he asked them whether they wanted another dose of Harriers tomorrow morning, uh, at which point they surrendered. Um, I think some 1,200 Argentinians surrendered to uh, about 600 British troops. So, success. Final victory and surrender followed soon after. In a remarkably short space of time, the Harrier had graduated from being an ingenious but untested engineering novelty to a combat veteran that turned the tide of battle. Those who witnessed the conflict, including frontline correspondent Max Hastings, were all now confirmed Harrier fans. It was miraculous what those Harriers proved able to do. And I think all of us who were down there at the time, uh, um, we knew what we owed to the Harriers. And when we first started seeing them operating from the shore, it was a great moment. It was a terrific boost for confidence. They were crucial to the war effort. There's no doubt about that. Because we, we would have had no other means of either defending the fleet against air attack from the air or attacking the Argentinian positions on the ground from the air. So that the Harrier used in the Falklands was a key component of the overall battle. Thanks to the Harrier, the Union Jack flew once again over the Falkland Islands. And almost 40 years on, Bob Iverson still has vivid memories of the part he played in the battle. This was the ejection seat handle that I used when I was shut down over Goose Green. It was recovered near the uh, wreckage uh, after the war. This is the, uh, the helmet that I was actually wearing when I was shot down over Goose Green. You can see the splatter from the miniature detonating cord that shatters the canopy so that you can pass through without being cut to pieces. Yep, many happy hours spent in these sort of helmets, but not that particular hour. The Harrier had proved its combat credentials in the harshest of environments. So why would this superjet be consigned to the scrap heap?
the Falklands War had given the Harrier jump jet the opportunity to distinguish itself in combat. It went on to play a vital role in the Balkans and the Middle East. But its status as a marvel of British engineering wasn't enough to prevent the RAF from writing the Harrier off before it reached obsolescence. A 2010 defence review resulted in a plan to modernise Britain's defences by building two new aircraft carriers and buying more than 100 replacement aircraft. We have decided to retire the Harrier, which has served this country so well for 40 years. Being told that the Harrier force as a whole was going to be retired was a shocker. It still had many years of life. It was still being developed. It was still being used around the world by other air force. And so getting rid of the Harrier was, on one hand, a purely financial decision. You're taking away the capability to put an aircraft on an aircraft carrier and deploy it to the other side of the world. In December 2010, the remaining British Harriers put on a final show at RAF Cottesmore. For the gathered ex-Harrier pilots, it was an emotional day. They flew a 16 aircraft formation, so there was a good record of the passing of the Harrier. And after they'd all landed at the end of it, they all did a vertical landing and taxied in. Um, there wasn't a dry eye in the crowd. I was very sad, very sad, not only because of the loss of the aeroplane, but there was a great feeling of camaraderie amongst the Harrier world. Um, not only RAF to RAF personnel, but you know, across the, the Navy side as well. Um, lots of good mates in the Harrier force. People get emotional about the Spitfire. I think it's the same sort of thing, it was just a great, thing to operate. Lovely to fly. It was most of my career was involved in or around the Harrier, and uh, I've had a cracking career out of it. It was very touching, very sad, a uh, sad day, uh, uh, which, you know, I think many people still regret. We could have had those carriers with the aircraft on for the last five or six years. When the Harrier left the Air Force, a void was created within the service and with personnel that have operated with the Harrier, whether it be in the UK or whether it be overseas, there was a genuine heartfelt loss when the Harrier had been officially disbanded from the service. Britain may have retired the Harrier, but 50 years since it first came into service, it is still being flown. The Royal International Air Tattoo is one of the UK's biggest air shows. Military aircraft from all over the world are on display. But the stars of the show are the Harriers belonging to the Spanish Navy, the Armada Española. Spain still uses carrier ships which suit the Harriers' capabilities. I've been flying this plane for about four years now, and uh, it's fantastic, you know, it's a really fun plane, so I really enjoy my job. We've been in France, Italy, the Mediterranean, pretty much gone covered the whole Mediterranean and a little bit of the Indic Ocean. For the crowds, today is a rare opportunity to see Harriers in action. People here love the Harrier, and so we're really, really excited to come here and show the Harrier to the British people. For legendary pilot Tom Leckie Thompson, who won the transatlantic air race in 1969, it's an opportunity to meet the current generation of Harrier pilots. 
I am the commanding officer in the squadron. And then you're going? And uh, uh, this, tonight I'm going to Colombia for a new deployment. It's also a chance to be reunited with the plane that made his name. The last time I flew in a Harrier was in 1985. Sandy was not even born. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it feels so special because it's such a dream to fly in. It's versatility to be able to take off, hover vertically, climb at a fantastic speed. There's no other aircraft like it. And the Spanish Navy won't be scrapping their Harriers for a while yet. It's supposed to be around for seven, eight years more, at least until 2025. It's a guarantee we're going to have Harriers. When it was first conceived by the engineers at Hawker Sidley, the Harrier's design was way ahead of its time. Testament to its genius is the fact it's taken half a century to come up with a replacement vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, reported to cost around 100 million pounds each. The notion of an aircraft that can take off and land like a helicopter is still there and is still needed. So that goes to prove that what they were trying to do in the 1950s is still relevant today. So somebody got it right back then. That says something about the early concept of the Harrier. The Harrier was an icon of British engineering. It was conceived, designed and built in this country. Um, probably the last aeroplane of that significance that is going to be able to say that was the case. So after decades of service to Britain, from West Germany during the Cold War to the battle for the Falklands, what is the Harrier's legacy? It gave confidence to us that we had an effective weapon uh, that stood a chance of slowing and stopping Russian forces coming across the German border. It, of course, made a history for the Falcon Islands, because without it, we would have been able to do anything about that. The Harrier is alongside some of the aviation greats because of what it could do. And those who flew it will tell you that it was the greatest aircraft. Well, taking you behind the scenes, the Queen's horses inside the Royal Stables is brand new tomorrow at seven. The craze that's sweeping the nation hits new heights next as one family sell up their home for a life on the road, its million pound motorhomes.